Petra, I'm I'm such a big fan of your work, and and I think this film is somehow very connected with the rest of the films that you've made. Um, and you've managed to make another film about grieving for something that we're losing, which is democracy in this case, and something that you know you're part of a generation fighting for. Um, and I felt being Spanish and also being part of a country that never reconciled um, the murders of the state uh, during dictatorship. I feel like you give us some some very important clues in this film. Um, you start the film with a very brave statement of acknowledging colonialism and talking about you know slavery, but also with a very brave statement of including one's own personal history. And um, you know, if you look into anybody's family's closet, you'll find people in both sides of the story. So uh, tell us a little bit about, I know you um, you were living in Brazil when the big demonstrations started happening, but um, tell us a little bit about keep telling the story of the fight for democracy and the fight for, um, um, you know, for some sort of sanity and reform within uh, government. Yes, thank you. So I think most of my films are somehow about trauma and 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 the making of the film an attempt to heal that trauma so my first film uh, is elena about my sister's death and suicide and the second is a journey into a woman's mind while she's waiting for a baby and kind of the dilemmas the underrepresented dilemmas of what it means to be a woman and conceive of a life and W it, and that's Almo and the Sigo. And with this film, I think the, the equation shifted. And it was not just about how to turn the personal into political, but how the political was utterly personal. And I think that became clear to me in 2016 when I think there was an earthquake in many countries around the world where we took democracy for granted, which was my case in Brazil. And it became clear that it was at risk and I was interested in investigating that relationship between a citizen and his or her own democracy. And, and it's a relationship of, of love and, and care, which I had not ever acknowledged because of the time of optimism that I grew up in Brazil. And, and so when, for finally, it made sense for me, all the elegies that people make to their own nation and kind of the pain of what it means to lose your country and the vision of you had for your future and the certainty that you had of having a democratic system that would kind of guarantee your rights as a citizen. And that trauma is almost as paralyzing and even more, I think, than the trauma of losing a close person. And that's what triggered me in wanting to go deep into that investigation. But at the same time, I feel like in your films, you are always very generous with understanding um, the contradictions and the tensions between um, how we get manipulated often. And I feel like the way that you look at these, um, at your fellow countrymen that are where like the sons and daughters of you know the the unionism labor movement, and they are now uh, the ones that are, you know, supporting from a grassroots movement some sort of witch hunt, which I think is what exactly what happened with Dilma and it's um and, and with Lula for that matter. But um and perhaps you can also bring us yes. to what's happening yesterday yeah. and the big news. Yeah, so yesterday we were in the middle of a panel called the Personals Political, where and I get the news that Lula had just been released from prison. Yes. And it's so moving because, uh, yes, the person was utterly political and it continues to be. And this was uh, happened after a decision of the Supreme Court to actually follow Brazil's constitution, which says that one could not be imprisoned after they exhaust their appeals. Lula was imprisoned, as many others, as part of car wash operation, which was great initially in its attempt to rid the country of corruption, but started to bend the rule of law to do so, and uh, I think what we found out is that when you do not respect due process when fighting against corruption, the corruption investigation itself gets corrupt, and the people lose respect for the law in a country that already has a very frail and young democracy that's extremely dangerous, and it takes us back 
to moments that I witnessed that felt like being back in the times of the Inquisition and of the witch hunting where people were asking for the death of their political opponents and asking for the prison, as you see in the film, of anyone just simply dressed in red. There's so many parallels with the United States mm -hmm. and with what happened here in the 2016 election with the lock her up. And it makes me think as well, what would have happened if Hillary had won? Um, would she have been impeached? Like what, I think, yeah, the parallels are immense and, and it, it can make one lose oneself because um, there's so much confusion today in, in terms of what are the facts and what are not. And I think for me, what was most clarifying in this process is the idea uh, that what guarantees a healthy democracy is not the Constitution. The Constitution is very short, of course it's essential, but it's not enough and it can be easily manipulated. Mm -hmm. And like what, what I most heard in the process was Dilma has to be impeached because it's constitutional to impeach her or Lula has to go to prison because it's constitutional to imprison him. It can be constitutional, but what is the use of the constitution? There are two unwritten norms that guarantee the health of a democracy, and that's like mutual respect and forbearance, self-control. And that is what we're losing um, increasingly in the last few years when, when more and more here at the Republican Party, and in Brazil it happened after 2014, where the opponents decide to use any means to destroy their political opponents. Like, and if that means calling your political opponents terrorists, saying that they shouldn't exist as a party, that they have to be impeached no matter what, even if there's no high crime and misdemeanor, which was the ca case in Brazil, different from the United States, of course, where there's clearly a kind of an abuse of power and trying to interfere with a foreign government country in a national election so mutual respect and forbearance is really respecting your opponent as a legitimate opponent and not uh, trying to destroy them because when you destroy them you destroy democracy mm -hmm. and, 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 and you win but mm -hmm. what, what was the cost of that right? I, I actually watching this film, it got me a greatly uh, a great appreciation from for Robert Mueller's uh, restraint in in his demeanor also and and many other uh, characters in politics. But I have many more questions, but perhaps you do too. So do I see any hands? Yes, right there. Temer, yeah. Thing, or in the United States, it's a hypocrisy when you, when you show one side of something and it's not your side that's doing it. It's like, oh, well, blind yours are. So I just want to know if those recordings are, you know, in the ether in, in Brazil. Yeah, so, so Car Wash Operation had a, a method which was to leak uh, parts of the investigation to the press. Uh, and, and those recordings were made by the investigators and they were leaking it as they happened. So that was uh, available nationally for everyone. And yeah, creating unbelievable turning points every week in the political scenario in Brazil. It's like the feeling, w w Brazilians are so exhausted because the feeling we have is that every week felt like 10 years. So we, we like call, got 100 years older in the past five years. <laughs> yeah, it was a question right behind you and then we got to you, sir. The hope, I, I mean, I think the international community has a huge role to play and the hope that we can have as Brazilians because, for example, the pressure against the immense deforestation in the, the Amazon that is happening right now that the international community did a little bit but needs to continue to do is essential because, I mean, they're 
government has been kind of incentivizing the burning of the Amazon and the killing of indigenous populations. There was an indigenous leader killed last week. And kind of the message that is going is like, please burn and explore the richnesses of the Amazon. Um, and it's already at its tipping point where it can become a savanna at any moment, and that would be tragic for the world. So we need to engage as a global community. And, there, and other things that are happening that are in, in, insane are, is that like 20% rise in police killings in Rio, even though Rio already has more people killed by the police than the entire United States. Yeah. So it's like legislated genocide where the president and the governor of Rio say like a real policeman is a policeman who kills. And th that's how, m I mean, the Marielle's death was a part of that. She was not killed by the police, but she was killed by the militia. Um, who She was a con congresswoman, um, black and gay, who was killed last year. And there's still pending questions about her assassination and, and very troubling questions. And we need pre international pressure for, for those questions to be answered. But I think the hope as well um, is in a like a general perception that our role as citizens, which at least for me in making this film was my greatest learning, is not to vote every four years. We have to be engaged thoroughly in every moment and, and kind of rise and be in the streets because otherwise democracy is just in a moment of total risk of complete erosion in a moment we can't afford it at all. There's a question there, sir, and then we go to you over there. Yeah, uh, two questions. To what extent do you think the intercept expose about Moro's involvement in more or less uh, targeting Luna and the Workers' Party uh, played a role in uh, Lula's release and the kind of the turnaround you see? Uh, and secondly, Brazil's occupation of Haiti, which was very controversial, uh, to what extent do you see that contributing to this rise in violence by the army that you that you just put? Uh, the, in, the revelations that happened in June were essential, I think, for the decision of, of the Supreme Court yesterday. I, I, I mean, I, I can't say that as a certainty, but it's my perception because uh, for those who don't know, in June there was a huge leak um, that revealed that Judge Morrow, um, which the, the lawyer, Lula's lawyer in the UN in the film already points at that, was acting not just as a judge but also coordinating m almost every step of the prosecutor's trial of Lula, like telling what they should do in every moment, how they should, um, like, what they should leak to the media, what they should not leak, how they should question him, what, like, every step. So, and as as j the lawyer says in the film, it's impossible to have a fair trial when the judge is acting, both as the prosecutor and the judge. And that became clear for everyone. Um, after those leaks, and and I think the decision of, of the Supreme Court yesterday was actually just to abide by Brazil's constitution, so, and it was a decision they were delaying for two years to make. Um, but I think that the leak and its revelations probably made a pressure for that to be done finally. The army, yes, I have not enough knowledge. Um, I read recently Perry Anderson's take on it, uh, and I recommend anyone to read um, Perry Anderson's essays on Brazil. There's a book that just came out called Brazil Apart that he wrote. He is extremely critical of, of, of Brazil's role in Haiti and says that Brazil played kind of a colonial role in our neighbor country, um, but I, I don't know enough to, to answer that question, unfortunately. We have the final question over there.
it was a long process. The film makes it seem much easier than it was. But uh, in the beginning of the process in March, I wrote a letter to Dilman Lula asking for an interview also to ISU and Temer, letters they never read. And then everyone I would meet inside the Congress, I would ask if they could introduce me, if there was somehow I could interview her but or him, but of course uh, they were taken by the urgency of the moment and it was impossible. Until I sneaked into a bus full of historians that was going into the presidential palace and then I could meet Dilma for the first time and and I handed her a DVD of my first film and said how I wanted to interview her. She said, ah, oh, yes, let's book an interview. It still took weeks and weeks for it to happen. It was a very formal interview that didn't even make it to the film. The, what you see in the film was still months later that I was able to be in the car with her. And with Lula, it was kind of similar. It, it took months and then one day I managed to get a meeting with him and in the meeting I showed him a teaser and was like, I just, as you see, the film is following people around. I don't want an interview like, if I can just be with you in the car. And he said, yeah, just wait for eight hours here. Maybe you'll be able to follow me to a meeting. And, and I was. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're telling me that we need to leave it here. But I'm sure she'll be happy to answer some more questions in the lobby, perhaps. Thank you so very much all for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.